are beginning, as you saw, a new series on, uh, on worship. We're calling uh, just fiercely. We want to fiercely worship God. And so we're, that's part of our Christian values. It's definitely part of the, uh, our vineyard values. Uh, the vineyard movement for 35 years has always put worship as a very, very high priority and, and, and expressing our love to God. And so we want to, uh, take four weeks and just kind of, of talk about that and spend some time actually, uh, uh, worshiping God and, uh, and pressing in. Now, I want you to notice at the top of your outline, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And so this concept of God, of loving God really is what Christianity is about. If I were to ask you, what is uh, what is the Christian faith? If you were to say, well, it's ethical behavior, it's church attendance, it's keeping certain rules, you would be wrong. It's really, if, if I were to describe it in two words, it'd be love affair. God loves us, and he wants to have a, a close relationship with us. And so he puts it here in the top one. It's not even in the top. It's the top one of the top ten, the, the Ten Commandments, but it's the very first one. He says the most important thing. In other words, if, you, if we don't learn how to love God, then we've missed the purpose of life. Uh, that, that's the, the most important thing we can do with our life is to learn to express our love to God and experience God's love for us. And so worship is, is, is a good description of, of, of what that is. Now, worship here at the Vineyard, we often refer to worship as being like uh, the singing portion of the way we declare our love to God. And, uh, but it's more than that. It's more than just singing. In fact, anytime you're loving God, you're worshiping. And so you can do that at home, you can do that in, at work, in your relationships. But what, why we talk about it uh, here as being the singing portion is because it's, it's kind of the time when we say, uh, we're not going to do anything else but just focus on that. Kind of give our very best to God in those moments. And so we, we, we worship God. And, and, and when I joined the vineyard, as I said, the vineyard has been around 35 years. I got, I got part of the vineyard maybe about 30 years ago. And, and uh, that was the first time I had heard the term uh, worshiping intimately, kind of this intimacy with God. And I'll tell you just straight up, when I first heard that, it sounded weird to me. Uh, intimacy with God? I don't know about all that. But what I discovered was... was Intimacy with God was, was, was found through singing songs to God and not just about God. You know, there's a lot, for, for many, many years, you know, songs were written, some great songs were written about God. How great God is and how awesome is he is. But what the vineyard really kind of brought to the, to, to the church, the Christian church really worldwide, uh, was this this, this new way of singing to God, love songs to God, so to speak, where we express our, our, our love to God and, uh, and, and, and allow our passion to be expressed through our music. So uh, that's one of the things we really want to, to kind of revisit. Hey, that's important. That's an important value for us. Now, the Bible teaches that this whole idea of intimacy with God is not something that we can achieve. It's not something we can, it's something God provides for us. He opens it up by his grace. That, that's something that, 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 uh, that through Christ, we're allowed to be intimate with God. That's an, if we try on our own, that's an, that's an, uh, an act of imp impossibility. It's just not going to happen. And in fact, we see in Scripture, if you look uh, throughout the Old Testament, you see kind of this distance, a lack of intimacy that, that people had with God. And it's, here's some examples here. Um, this distance is described as God being far above us, high above us. He's the high and lofty one in the heaven. Uh, in the heavens, Isaiah 66, 1 says, this is what the Lord says, heaven is my throne and earth is is my footstool. So there's this huge chasm. There's this, this gulf between us and God. He's way up there. The man upstairs, you know, that guy way up there. And, and, and Jesus bridged that gap. It's through Christ that the New Testament writers say God is not far from any one of us. 
for in him we live and move and have our being. And then another way that God is described in this distance is that God's, he's far away. I mean, we, we would like him to be close by us, but he's not. He's just, he's distant. He's way out there. And in the Old Testament, we're repeatedly shown this same concept, like when uh, Moses goes and uh, has this experience with the burning bush and God is there in the burning bush that's not consumed. And uh, as Moses gets close, God says, uh, don't come any closer. He says, you're standing on holy ground. And then Moses' response is to hide. He hid his face. Then Moses is called up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, those tablets, and God's going to communicate with him. He says, but only Moses, nobody else. There's a perimeter all around Mount Sinai. Nobody's even to touch the very foot of the mountain. Even if an animal touches it, it'll die. And so there's this distance. You know, but it says, but you set a limit around Mount Sinai that the people are not to cross. Tell them not to go up on the mountain or to not even touch the foot of it. And then God's giving these instructions, uh, for example, when he builds the temple, the tabernacle. And he says uh, that there's to be this curtain that separates. So God's presence, the, the, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets representing God's presence, that's in the, the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And then he says there's this thick six-inch curtain that separates that from where the priest would be able to come in to give sacrifices. Even the people weren't even allowed in that area. That was called, you know, the holy place. And then, uh, and then everyone else is out in the courtyard. And yet we see God breaking down those walls, breaking those walls in the New Testament. You have, uh, for example, in Hebrews 12, it says, unlike your ancestors, you didn't come to Mount Sinai, that place where you couldn't get close to God, where he was far away. He says, but you've come to Mount Zion, the city where the living God resides. You've come to Jesus who presents us with a new covenant, a fresh charter from God. So he says, you're invited. No longer are you, is God far off. You're invited to be close to God. And because of this new covenant, it says, brothers and sisters, because of the blood of Jesus, we can now confidently go into the holy place. Jesus has opened a new and living way for us to go through the curtain. That Greek word, hagion, for holy place. You know, some translations say it's, the, you know, we're allowed into the holy of holies or the most holy place. Other translations like this says into the holy place. It really doesn't matter because it's now just what happened was when Jesus died, the curtain was torn. That thick curtain was torn from top to bottom. The invisible hand of God tore it open, and all of a sudden, there's no more of this division between where God is and people are. And so, and so it's one room anyways. And God says, you're invited into that room, that place of holiness, that place you're welcome, and I invite you in to commune with me and to have intimacy with me. And so where God was high above, where he's far away, he's now close. Another uh, uh, description is God is is so morally perfect and pure, we can't be close to him. He's holy and we're sinful. And so God is pure. And at one point, Paul contrasts this idea of righteousness. He says there's God's righteousness, which is perfect. And then mine, and even though he lived a very religious life, very, I mean, it was very strict in his ethical behaviors. He goes, as he sized up his own morality compared to God's, he says, it's worthless. And so he says, Paul says this, he says, not having my own righteousness, he goes, that's not going to be helpful in me achieving intimacy with God. He goes, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now, for us humans, we gauge our morality by its relative, right? I mean, we, when, if somebody says, are we good? We think to ourselves, well, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't murder people. But I'm not Mother Teresa, I'm not, I'm not Billy Graham, and, and we kind of figure out where we kind of land and then make an evaluation because we're not absolutely perfect, none of us, but yet God is. And so holiness can't be mixed in with sinfulness. Light and darkness can't both coexist. And so God is perfectly holy, we're sinful, we can't coexist without some other way of it happening. And God's, init his plan, he initiated it, is through Jesus Christ. Christ came. He died on the cross. The blood of Christ was made us holy in God's sight. 
It's God's son, his, that righteous blood, the, 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 the sacrifice that was once and for all. When we put our faith in Christ, we enter in all of a sudden now, we can be close to God. We can step into that place without being ashamed and being distant. Now, the Bible uses different metaphors to talk about what this intimacy might look like. One of the ways it describes that intimacy is through friendship, that we're friends with God. Jesus says this in John 15. He says, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. And so Jesus here is describing in John 15 a friendship that is not just based on similarity of interest, you know, or similarity of circumstance. You know, we have kids of the same age or we like to golf together. So I guess I'm friends with him or we're co-workers or we like to go shopping at the pottery or, you know, those are the, often the ways that we kind of evaluate what a friend is. But Jesus says, no, this kind of friendship is deeper, more intimate, closer. And he describes it as, uh, as more than just uh, sharing, you know, we're taking the same class together or we work at the same place. He says, no, we share secrets. We share secrets. There's a Swiss psychiatrist. He's a Christian named Paul Turney, and he wrote a number of great books. One of them was called Secrets. And what he said was that, uh, that uh, children, one of the ways that they discover that they're independent from their parents is when they when they keep secrets from their parents. And so it starts out real innocent. You know, I mean, it's just like, I know something that you don't know. And they're grinning and they're excited. But it's really an important point for the kid psychologically because they discover I'm, I'm, no law, I'm really a separate entity than, than my parents. Before that, we were all kind of one, one protoplasm, all kind of mixed together. But now I'm separate. I'm, I, I stand off. And then even as... Uh, Teenagers, as they discover their identity, one of the things as they grow into te into towards adulthood is as they start becoming uh, very uh, protective of their privacy, right? They're, they they keep secrets, they, and and some of that is healthy, because they're discovering I am separate from them. I am I that's part of who I am in my own identity. And then as we become adults, we give as a kind of an act of friendship, we, we, we say, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a gift. This is a secret. This is something that's close to me. Maybe I've never told anybody. Maybe I've only told a couple people. But I'm going to entrust you with this secret. And that's a closer friend, right? That's, 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 that's a deep friendship when you share something very secret, very special to you that you don't share just to anybody. And that's what God, Jesus says in John 15. He says that's the friendship that God offers with us. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about intimacy. That he's going to share with you things that not just everybody understands, not just everybody gets. And he shares. And we discover that from his word. The Holy Spirit speaks that into our hearts. We start to experience it. And then he wants that back from us. When we share and we start to disclose, God, this is what's going on in my life. This is, these are secrets this is my secret fears that I just can't share with everybody. And, we, and that creates a close relationship with God. If, you don't, if, you, if we don't share that, we limit that. Another metaphor that he uses is this idea of a father with their child or a parent-child relationship. Jesus taught us to pray. He says, pray our father who art in heaven. Right? Not, not dear, awesome creator of the universe. But our Father, this, this endearing term, 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. We become children of God through faith in Christ. Not everybody is a child of God. Everybody was created by God, and so therefore everybody is a creature of God. But you become a child of God when you're born into God's family. When we put faith into Christ, what happens is the Holy Spirit changes us. 
And all of a sudden, we're born into this spiritual family, thus the term born again. It's this idea of being born into a spiritual family, and we get adopted into this family, this spiritual family. We weren't part of it before. Now we're part of it. 1 John 1, 12 says, But to all who believed in him and accepted him, so there's two parts there, putting, you know, acknowledging it. Yes, I believe in him, but also accepting Christ in your life. He gave them the right to become children of God. We get the authority. We, we have the right to stand in this position as a son or a daughter of, of our father who is in heaven. And so there's this, this metaphor of this, uh, maybe of a little child, you know, who's uh, cuddling in their father's arms strong arms bringing safety or maybe a, a little child nursing at, at, at you know because it's a parent you know you know nursing at their mother's breast this this safe full warmth this idea of just this close relationship very intimate now I wanted to say something regarding the father relationship kind of parenthetically and what I've noticed over the years as I've talked to so many people it seems like it's it's an unquestioned fact that if you have had a bad relationship with your father or a non-existent one, that you're predisposed to have this bad relationship with your heavenly father because you didn't have a good, uh, a good example. And it's just everywhere. I mean, that's just kind of like an unquestioned fact. And you would think that if it's an unquestioned truism, that there would be Lots of Bible verses to support that, but actually there's almost none. And here's what, listen to me. I am not saying that if you had a bad relationship with your father that you, that, that won't affect your relationship with God the Father. I'm not saying that, but here's what I'm saying. I am challenging the determinism idea that, that if you have a bad relationship with your father, that you will have a bad relationship with, you know, trying to connect with God. God the Heavenly Father. And that, I would say, is not accurate. That is not true. It, it, that does not necessarily correlate. Uh, let me give you an example. In 2 Kings 22, you have a guy, his, uh, just a young kid. He was eight years old, King Josiah. He became king at eight years old, and then he was king for 31 years. And the Bible says that he lived cl a close relationship with God. And... Um, that he that it says that all the kings before him and all the kings after him, none of them pursued God like he did, and had this close and close and intimate relationship as as he did. And you would say, well, 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 that's terrific. But I bet he had a great role model then. No, actually, he had a terrible role model. His dad and his grandfather were the worst adulterers. Uh, 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 idolaters, excuse me. They, they were into child sacrificing. They, they were some of the worst in all of Jewish history. That was his role model. He had terrible role models of, of this father-son relationship. And yet it didn't affect his relationship at all with his heavenly father. And so it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be that way. Because sometimes people think, oh, well, that's, you know, I don't have a chance at being, you know, it's, I have all of these obstacles I have to overcome because my, my dad was absent or he was abusive or violent. And it just doesn't have to be uh, that way at all. Uh, somebody who says that, I would say, you don't know the power of Christ to redeem a person, to change somebody, to uh, turn somebody around. There, there are no limits on the, how, how close we can be with God. The main reason we do have trouble sometimes connecting with God is because of our fallenness, our, our brokenness, the, the, the frailty of humanity and, and, and on those things. It's, it's, not, it's not determined by our parents. A third uh, metaphor is this idea of this marriage relationship. Relationship of a man and a woman in marriage is even more intimate than a father and a son or a father and a daughter or even between two friends. And this close, the best marriage you could picture, they, they don't even get a glimpse of what is cap uh, the capacity of what we experience in our relationship with God. 
But it's a metaphor saying it's kind of like that. When, when God created the universe, we see in Genesis, he says each time he created the, you know, a, a part of the, the, the world, he says it is good. You know, it is good. And then when he creates man and woman in this relationship, he goes, it is very good. But we see when he, when he talks about the relationship of the bride of Christ and Christ, he describes it as being perfect, higher than, than, than all the other things in creation. He says, notice there in Ephesians 5, he says, Christ gave up his life for the church to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of what? God's word. That sounds like that's important. You think? Let's check it out. Okay, let's read that again. Christ gave up his life for the church to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. How do we get cleaned? Through reading God's word, by listening to God's word, letting that just, there's, it's kind of like soap. You know, have you ever had a, do you, have you ever been around somebody who, who has B.O.? They, they don't like the faith. That gets old, right? You just kind of think, do you know what a bar of soap is? There's some Christians that don't know what a bar of soap is. God's word is our soap. It cleans us. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Indeed, he will be holy and without, she will be holy and without fault. Talk, referring to this relationship that Christ has with with us, this metaphor of the, being the, the bride of Christ, that we have uh, the secured uh, promise through a covenant, self-giving, self-disclosing, all of those things. Now, again, I want to just say parenthetically, if you are single, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to have the kind of relationship that's being described here in this, in this uh, marriage covenant type, type of metaphor. I mean, the, think of the two, two of the New Testament figures who had some of the closest relationship with God possible. Paul, the apostle, and Jesus of Nazareth were both single. And so just because you're single or maybe you are in a relationship that is, that is, that is uh, underperforming, <laughs> that's not very rewarding, that doesn't, that doesn't determine what kind of relationship that you can have with, with God. Uh, let me give you another example in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 25, there's a woman, Abigail, who had a very close relationship with God. And yet she was married to a fool, a guy who was abusive, he was violent, he was a drunkard. And yet that didn't affect her relationship with, with God. So the Bible says these are the kinds of, it gives us these pictures. Pictures can be very powerful. It gives us these pictures. These are the kinds of things that make up a close relationship with God. Now let me just give, the Bible gives us some 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 more two hints I want to just close with, and then we'll go into some worship. Number one is, is being slow. When we're communicating to God, we need to slow down. In other words, sometimes in the vineyard, we refer to this idea of being uh, what we call dialing down. In other words, even though our mind and our bodies can go at a rapid pace, our souls are not like that. Our souls are more like, they're less like a Ferrari and more like a Fiat. We just, we, our souls, so we need to slow down so that it can enrich our souls. And that's part of the way we communicate with God. And so in worship, if you're trying to go at Ferrari pace, you're multitasking, you've got your phone out, you're doing this, you're thinking of that, what I'm going to do later, and you know, and, and you're not in the moment. And so part of slowing down is so that you can be in the moment. We set aside usually 25 to 30 minutes in singing and worship. And so trying to be there when it's over, it's over. And then you go and eat food or do whatever you're going to do. But, but being in the moment, saying, God, I want to experience this closeness. I want, to, I, want to, I want to be able to have something more than just a Snapchat type of relationship with you. Psalm 131.2 says, but I have stilled and quieted myself just as a small child is quiet with its mother. So this stilling our souls. Number two. The second hint is, is this idea of being sincere. I would caution you with trying to present yourself to God as you think God wants you to be. Just be who you are. That's all God really wants. 
He just, that's what friendships are based on, right? You don't have to pretend you're somebody else, not your closest friends. You can be you. And so part of sincerity is saying, I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to put on a face. I'm just going to be me. This is it, you know? Jesus said, don't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and as honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you and to God, from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. So this is what God says. He says, just be yourself and to slow down. I want to just uh, close with this last verse. This is a challenge for us to say, hey, God, I want to step into this. I can't earn intimacy with you, but I can receive it. It says, his unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he gave, and this gave him great pleasure. You see, every day that we don't live at least momentarily with God in intimacy is a wasted day. Every day you should have some time where you connect with God. And at home, you know, throughout the week, it might be in prayer. You can worship at home. You can worship, of course, in your small group or but here is, this is a time you've set aside. And so we just take advantage of that. We say, God, I want to give you great pleasure and I want to receive from that relationship. Okay? We'll bow our heads and we'll pray. God, I just want us as a congregation right now just to slow down. Because sometimes our thoughts can race so quick. And we're ready to get up and do the next thing. But Lord, I, we want to just invite you into this place in our life. Like a child lying safely and secure in the arms of their loving father. Like a wonderful marriage where we can be vulnerable and unashamed with each other. Lord, help us to learn how to communicate through prayer, through, through worship. And to not try to put on something else that we think you want from us. Just to be ourselves. Some of you need to just say, you know what, I, I feel, you probably feel distant. You're saying that those things where you were describing earlier about God being distant, that's how I feel. But God, that's not God's desire. He, he's inviting you in to this relationship. Would you respond to that? Just say, God, make me a new creation. I want to be a child of God. Thank you for creating me, but that's not enough. I want to be born into your family. Forgive my sins. I invite your Holy Spirit to come. Renew my mind. And come into my life. Tell me those secrets. Reveal them to me. And I'll share I'll share with you mine. In Jesus' name, amen.